Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Deborah Eckerling, author of Your Goal Guide and creator of The Dev Method for Goal Setting Simplified. And every week I bring together three friends to chime into the special topic, and then it magically becomes an episode of The Dev Show Podcast. You can't reach your goals on your own. You need your peeps. So today you get to meet some of my peeps and they also get to meet each other. I'm really excited about the topic. And I believe it was inspired by you, Rob Kuttner, because you were on when we were talking about creating content a couple months ago and your book is not goblins. So of course I need to have you on at the end of October. So Rob, really glad to <laughs> connect, reconnect and have you here. Um, and Richard Walter, um, who is if you don't know his name, you you know who he is, even if you don't know he is who he is. But Richard and I met years ago when I was doing the newsletter for the writer store. And then he's got a new book coming out and it came across my email and I said, you gotta join in the conversation. So really excited to have you here. And we gotta cover the entrepreneurs. And for that, we have my friend Orly Zewi. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember, we met through Innovation Women, but we also know each other through the Jeff Pulver world of 140 and Bond conferences. So I love storytelling from all different aspects and it's gonna be a great conversation. So I would love to have you all introduce yourselves a little bit better. I mean, beyond me saying you're awesome and you're gonna be great at this topic, no pressure. Um, so let's start with you, Rob, and then we will go from there. So Rob, Welcome, good to see you. Please share who you are, why you're here, and why storytelling. Wow, okay, uh, so I am a uh, TV and book writer. Um, uh, I've written for Late Night, including The Daily Show, John Stewart, Conan O'Brien shows, and uh, some children's animation as well, um, as well as some adult animation. Um, and then some books, uh, like the one you mentioned. and. I think everything is storytelling. Even uh, even the monologue jokes that used to write for Kun, even one of those is a story. It's like the DNA. Okay. Every well, everything is a story, and ideas are everywhere. Absolutely. Richard. Well, ma'am, I I uh, uh... I just got manned by Richard Walter. Ah. <laughs> I came, I came to California, I thought, uh, for three weeks in 1966, the summer of 1966. And I recently decided I'm going to give it another 57 years, if it still hasn't worked out for me, back to the Apple. I, I fell into USC film school um, at that time. And it was a magic moment. It was the, the George Lucas era. George was a classmate of mine. He, I'm told that he actually calls it the Richard Walter era. Yeah. I love it. Thanks, thanks for laughing. Um, I ended up uh, studying screenwriting there and, and having a substantial career working in the freelance screenplay market um, for, for quite a few years. I also uh, have published uh, uh, books. I have um, uh, my third novel coming out soon it's called deadpan and it's a uh, it's from a new publisher heresy press and it'll be available in uh, later this year and, and 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 early next year it's my third published novel i also have god forgive me three uh, books on screenwriting that have been in in print for about 35 years and um are are, are quite uh, quite widely uh, used I, i'm told in uh, in, in courses and, um, you know, screenwriting classes uh, uh, across the world. So really, there's no kind of literary laundry that I haven't taken in. I've, I've written fiction and nonfiction and screenplays and even retro hippie that I am, um, corporate propaganda, <laughs> government films, even films for, the, for law enforcement and the military. You don't get bored. Uh, I, I'll say one last thing, and that is that on um, in 1977, I went to a party at Malibu and was invited there to join the screenwriting faculty at UCLA Film School. And I ended up a, a tenured full professor <laughs> and retired only about uh, 
five or six years ago after more than, than 40 years there. And I did have the privilege of, of working with uh, a huge number of um, really, really talented uh, new writers and, and also good, good colleagues. And all of your stories have stories, I am sure. <laughs> And, and the other thing that, and, and then we'll move on to Orly. I love that you came here for three weeks and stayed. I think that's really the only way to move to California is to <laughs> check it out and say, okay. I mean, I, I tailgated two cars with my mom 25, almost 26 years ago, and we've been here ever since. So there's something, if you're an LA person, you just can't help it as part of your story, right? So Orly. Great to see you. Thanks for joining the conversation. Please share who you are. And, and I know what person in this trio. I did this on purpose because I wanted to create to cover all aspects of the story. So I'm really happy that you're here. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So in addition to being the brand whisperer, I'm also the author of the book, Ready Launch Brand, The Lean Marketing Guide for Startups. And the book is actually... The core of the book um, are, um, is really founder stories around their marketing fails and wins. And, um, and I spent quite a, almost two years interviewing um, founders and uh, ended up only really um, ended up focusing on, on eight, well, 10, I guess, uh, but eight specific stories um, that are weaved in with marketing myths, like um, my favorite one, which is um, we'll invest it. We'll we'll pay for marketing when we have money to pay for marketing, um, which means we never do it. <laughs> and um, and also, you know, the idea that uh, for me, storytelling is at the core of what I do. Because what I what I do, I, I I say that you know, I really I only have one superpower. I make fuzzy clear. And um, what I do is I work with solopreneurs to clarify their zone of, of genius, and then I communicate it in such a way that their ideal clients get it, want it, value it, and will pay a premium for it. So, and, and that really has to do with stories, right? So around brand storytelling. So as we get into our conversation, I can address that more, but that's, that's basically it. That's who I am. That's what I do. Awesome. And, and it's true. Everybody, and I think we'll all agree, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story to tell. It's a matter of whether they know, the, first of all, fiction, nonfiction, whether they know it, they embrace it. Uh, but let's start with the easy question, which is, what is storytelling? I mean, I feel like it's one of those definitions where the words are the <laughs> definition, but I'm going to make you answer it anyway. Um, Richard, you want to start us off? Yeah, well, storytelling is telling a story, and I think what we want to talk about is what is that? What what what's a story? Uh, I think everybody knows what tell means, but what's a story? And I do believe that that the you know I mentioned that I I wrote three screenwriting books. I apologized actually for it. Um, all of the uh, screenwriting books, in, including my own, I think McKees and Sid Fields and everybody else's, are really different spins on uh, the, the great screenwriting book of all time, which is Aristotle's Poetics, really just a ragged little pamphlet that was written, uh, you know, 500 years before Jesus walked the earth. And it really does uh, uh, break down story into its components. Uh, and of course, it, the components are what a story is. And they, uh, there were three of them, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, you know, the beginning is the part before which you, you have nothing, and the end is the part after which you, you have nothing. And um, I like to say to writers that the, the, they should look at the poetics not as some high-flung theoretical treatise, but uh, a kind of how-to, a, a guide, a manual, you know, like how to change the carburetor on your Honda Civic. And I always wait for people to say to me, Richie, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. A beginning, a middle. Everybody knows the beginning comes first, and there's nothing before the beginning, and that the end is is the last thing, and there's nothing after that. And yet, you look at screenplays, you look at movies, and you see they don't start at the beginning. They usually start before the beginning, and they go on after the end. Every movie is two. That's been long now, and um, the 
important thing to keep in mind is that the three parts, the beginning, middle, and the end, they're not equal. The, the beginning is short. It's the middle that's the big part. And the end is the shortest part of all. And uh, what does that look like? That looks like an idealized, romanticized human life with childhood and and then the big stuff, and then a quick ending. Raise your hand high if you're hoping for a long, drawn-out ending with, you know, uh, IV tubes and resuscitators and stuff like that. So I believe every story, every narrative is a is a portrait of the artist uh, who who created it, and um, that we don't really need to think about that while we're doing it. Indeed, we must not think about that while we do it. It'll make us self-conscious, but that's what it's all about. It's a bio biological enterprise. When we look at a movie, I used to think we're looking through the screen uh, like a window into other people's lives, but I realize it's not a window. It's a mirror. We're really looking back at, at uh, the reflections of our own lives. I like that. Interesting. Um, so, Rob? You want to add? Do you want a yes and add on yeah, to that? Yeah, of course. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna rebut all of Richard's points because I, I love it. Okay, great. Have fun. Um, I, I think of a story in terms of um, <clears throat> and I also I also I didn't mention this, but I teach um, uh, comedy sketch writing at Loyola Marymount University uh, Film and TV School. So I've done a lot of thinking about like how stories work in the sense of comedy stories, like little short comedy stories. Um, and what something that stuck struck with me is um, George Saunders' book, uh, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain. I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's a um, really excellent uh, dissection. It's basically, it's the class he teaches at Syracuse, but where he goes through some of the great Russian short story writers like Chekhov and, and Tolstoy and... Um, and um, and uh, it analyzes uh, basically like why they're still so effective, like why they work as a story, why they're still so gripping, even though their cultural and historical contexts are so quite removed from ours. And one of the big points that he gets gets away with is um, is a short story or a long story is a transfer of energy. It's transferring some kind of energy. And a gripping tale is one where it, it, it increases the energy, usually through friction and conflict, right? And it keeps increasing. Or maybe it goes up and down. It plays with your heart, you know. Or maybe the energy is a romance, you know, that sort of thing. But it's basically about uh, transfer energy. And so I think like that's like both the definition of us, you know, as a, as a writer, like transferring like the energy of our lived experience to an audience's minds. But also I think the structure of a story is like starting is like you know like physics again, like starting in one place and ending in another, like energy like you can't really start it in the same place something has to have changed whether it's visible or not <laughs> okay so the crux of it is transferring our experience to someone else yes awesome i like that so orly what what do ye old branding and nonfiction <laughs> author have to say well uh of course i'm coming at this from a very different perspective so um you know, brand story. So story storytelling for me, you know, is really around evoking powerful emotions and insights, right? Through the through the the tool of stories, uh, something happens. You know, there's usually that arc. Um, uh, there's usually a hero and a and a villain. And uh, from a brand story perspective, I think of the hero as being the solution that you're offering as the as as the the the, the uh, brand and the the. And the villain is the problem that's keeping your client up at night. So that's kind of how I approach it. And the, but the definition of brand storytelling is that it uses narrative to create an emotional value driven connection between your customer and your brand. And, it, you know, from, uh, from, uh, since I'm looking at it from the brand perspective, um, you know, 68% of consumers say that brand stories influence their pur purchasing decision. And storytelling, this is kind of an amazing statistic, actually increases the value of products by up to 2,706%, which is kind of a wildly specific statistic. Um, and this is why nine out of 10 top brands use storytelling. Um, and for me, when I think of storytelling 
from, you know, a brand storytelling. It's really about, you know, it's not obviously, ultimately you want people to buy your product, your service, whatever, whatever it is, but you're doing it in a way that's helping people discover why you're the right solution as opposed to, you know, um, someone once said, um, you know, you want to lead people with your solution, not to, I mean, lead them to your solution, not with your solution. So the idea is that you're bringing somebody along using a story, right? Using a story arc to kind of help people understand kind of where they are in this. Is this something that they might be interested in? And then opportunities to engage. That's where social media comes in, where, where you engage to see what other people are thinking or uh, looking at kind of adding your perspective because it's a living, breathing thing. And I think stories in are a living, breathing thing. And, you know, they, before the printing press was invented, you know, people used images. I mean, you've got the, you know, the caves in Lascaux, you know, in France and um, Egyptian hieroglyphics. I mean, I, you know, storytelling has been around as long as humans. And I love that you brought that up because I, I've been working on my November shows and I'm doing one on journaling in a few weeks. And I, I have it in my head to get a visual artist in. So it's not just journaling through words, it's through pictures. So I, I love that you just validated what I've been working on this afternoon. So thank you. You're welcome. For that. Also, just FYI, we process images in seconds versus because it's not, it's a nonlinear translation. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why images are so powerful when we're trying to convey something. But yet still, not everyone can tell a story. So what do you think stops people from being able to articulate the things that are on their in their head onto the page? Well, I would say the, the biggest mistake that writers make is uh, we write too much. When we were talking, I was talking earlier about beginnings, middles, and ends, starting before the beginning and, st and ending after the end. Uh, those are examples of writing too much. I neglected to mention, I'll mention it now, that uh, it's not just the whole narrative that has beginnings, middles, and ends. For example, a screenplay, which is what I've done. A, I've, I've worked a lot as a screenwriter and I've taught screenwriting for over 40, 40 years. It's not just a screenplay that has a beginning, middle, and end, but parts of, a, of the screenplay. Every scene has a beginning, a middle, and an end, a point before which you need nothing, a point after which you need nothing. Indeed, even parts of parts, for example, lines of dialogue, have points before which you need nothing and points after which you need nothing. If you have a line of dialogue that says, I think what, what we need to do is blah, blah, blah. Well, you've started before the beginning. We don't need I think. Whatever you say comes. Now, people will say to me, yeah, but that's the way people, people t really do talk. So what's wrong with that? Two things. Two things wrong with that. The second thing first. The second thing is, you don't need to go to the movies. You don't have to park the car and buy a ticket to hear the, the way people really talk. You can just step out into the street or into the next room. But what's the worst thing about, about the way people really talk? It's boring. It's boring the way people generally talk. I went on a walk today, as I do every day, and I saw somebody, and I, and I said, hi, how are you doing? And he said, just great. What about yourself? I said, pretty good. How do you like this weather? It's cooler than it than has been. I, I, I think things are get I'm blah, blah, yak, yak, da, da, da. That's fine in the, in the street. That's the way people really talk. But if you're asking people to give their attention and their consideration and their time, let's not even talk about the $18 or whatever it costs to get into the arc light if it's still in business. <laughs> um, you better be delivering character and story freight with everything that's there. People don't have the discipline to do that. That's hard to do. If if you uh, 
uh, to spend even just three or four or five hours a day really trying to do that. It, it's difficult to do. It means creating a lot of stuff that you're going to throw away. Learning, maturing as a writer, I believe, is not learning to throw away, but learning to love to throw away. <laughs> um, Rob, agree? Yeah. Um, uh, I agree with so many of those things. And I just to, just to amplify, I think, Richard's point, I think there is a fear sometimes, um, maybe sometimes held by those who haven't been practitioners, uh, who haven't been in the creative battlefield, um, of like, oh, gosh, I can't get rid of this idea because this idea is so good and there won't be another one after it. And so we, we, we cling tenaciously and try to, as they say, polish a turd. Uh, we sort of double down on the same creative, trying to force it to work. I have certainly been guilty of this myself many times. But also what I've learned over time is to not be afraid of just like ripping it up and starting over and something better will come. And sometimes, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier in the, in the question, I think, Deborah, about that, that difficult translation of like translating your image or your idea into paper, like the first one, two, three or four like iterations, you might not get it, but like you're getting closer, like your brain is doing work, I think, towards finding what that story is by finding out what's not working. So I think, you know, to just extend, I think Richard's point, I think like uh, is trying a lot of different things and not being afraid of journey over, I think is like, like really instrumental to actually finding the real story instead of sort of a, you know, sort of a synthetic story that's a familiar one full of tropes and cliches that we already know, which we could easily construct around the elements we have. If we don't find, don't find the real story, we may have to keep stripping things away. One of my favorite things on the planet is brainstorming. I mean, it is all through your goal guide and when I'm doing workshops and what have you, because the more stuff you get out of your head, the more stuff you have to work with. You can't right. rearrange yeah, those yeah. blocks of information in your, well, I think you can reach in. I can't. <laughs> Well, so one, one of you was going to jump in and so, I was so well, excited. I forgot which one. So, well, so I, I think I'm next, but I, you know, I'm coming at this from such a different perspective, but I, I love, I love what I'm hearing because it's still, you know, it doesn't, whatever story you're telling, you still need to, you need to follow, follow this kind of thinking. And I think that what you were saying, Rob, about throwing things away. So, you know, I, I like to quote, I, I believe it's, um, I believe it's uh, it's Dickens, uh, or I think it was Dickens. I always get them confused. Anyway, uh, who said if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter? Right. Um, and Charles Dickens. Yeah, I think it was he Perfect. was the one who said this. And uh, what I love about that is, you know, especially in the work that I do when I work with people, you know, the first thing they do is they just tell me everything. Like, do they just, you know, it's a whole, it's a brain dump, right? Like, you just tell me everything, tell me everything. But really, when you when you parse this out, and, and this is back to both what Richard and Rob have been saying, you know, my job as I see it is I help pull out kind of the golden nuggets of what they're really trying to say that's going to be meaningful to the person who hears it. Because in my world, you're not telling the story for your own entertainment or amusement, just as you're not if it's a screenplay, right? It's got to resonate with the audience in, in the, the world in which I, I operate you know, the purpose of your story is to attract your ideal customers and the people who actually want this. And so people have a tendency to try to say everything. And, you know, I always say, if you say, you know, if you, if you say, if you talk about everything, you know, you connect with no one, right? You, you can't talk to everyone. You need to identify. So, this, so for the first step for me in the storytelling process is who are you and then who are they? Those are the two key things that have to happen. If you don't understand who that uh, uh, client is, then you're really just saying words, but you're not going to connect with them because ultimately it's about solving a problem. And so the story that that my client would say would tell is a is a story around around the idea of not just what's in it for them. But how how will their life be better, transformed, uh, improved in some way as a result of 
whatever product service, right? And it's not, I'm not talking like toothpaste, you know, cause you have a better smile or whatever. I'm not talking about that kind of product. Um, cause I, I, I'm in the B2B space and the uh, business to business. So it's mostly, you know, if it's a product, it's like, it's like a workshop or, um, you know, a podcast or what have you. But the thing that people really struggle with is what, what do I leave out? Because I don't know what is the really important thing. And so it's very similar to what both Richard and Rob are saying, but has a different, it has a slightly different purpose, but the, the, the construct is still, is still very similar. I, I agree. I think that for much of my life, I thought that writing was, there's a space there and you're adding, you're putting stuff up there. And I re realize what you're doing is quite the opposite. You're taking, there's a lot of stuff up there. You're taking stuff away and you find what's what's already there. I never knew a writer who wasn't surprised by something that seemed to arise spontaneously. And then now that I'm elderly, I, I, I have a new phase, which is instead of taking things out of the way and finding them, you have to get out of your own way and let your story find you. And with regard, you mentioned, Orly, the uh, Dickens letter. I'm reminded, apropos what we've been talking about, a, a famous letter from Hemingway mm. to his uh, editor, the legendary Mac Maxwell Perkins, on and on and on, nine pages. <laughs> At the very end, Hemingway says, well, that's about it for now, Max. Please forgive me for writing such a long letter. I did not have the time to write a short one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. See, I always thought it was Mark Twain. Maybe it is Mark Twain. It could be. I, for uh, some reason, I, I know there are different centuries, and for <laughs> some reason, I get them confused. But you're right; it is Mark Twain. Maybe Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I think what we're saying is that in every century, every century's got one, right? But the truth of the matter is, it's when you have the time and the energy and the wherewithal. And then the other thing is, so we're recording this the end of October. November is National Novel Writing Month, which the sole purpose is to get a novel out of your head and onto the page. And you've got such a short time frame, you don't have the time to edit. All you can do is get the words out. So um, are we fans of this process? Question mark? I, I think mean, it's a it's a drawn out the the real writing writers will tell you is rewriting, and a lot a lot a lot of very fine ed educators Annie Lamont and others will tell you you have to allow yourself a shitty first draft is what she calls it, and you have to allow yourself to be imperfect and dissatisfied. I never you know I have crossed. I have modest success as a writer myself, but in my capacity at UCLA, I travel the world. I cross paths with the most upscale, the most ad ad admired, um, the most successful, the most highly acclaimed writers that there are. And not one of them was really pleased and totally satisfied with the way anything came out. I remember once running into Julius um, Epstein, meeting Julius Epstein, he wrote, among other things, Casablanca. <laughs> and I said to him, oh, Mr. Epstein, I'm so thrilled to meet you all. I or any of my film phony pals hope in our lives once we would touch something as timeless and eternal as you did with Casablanca. And wouldn't it be nice to report that he said, oh, that's kind of you. Uh, how nice of you. No, no, no. He's a writer. He said, ah, Casablanca, Schmasablanca. They fucked that up. You know, the scene with, you know, he was here. He lived here for 70 years, but he never lost that Brooklyn twang that he had. You know, the scene with that and, and such as up my brother, Philip and me, we went, but oh, no. It was a griping, quetching about how oh, they yeah. ruined his movie. What movie? Casablanca. Amazing. I love That's that. That's a great story. Uh... Maybe that's why I prefer working with um, in the business world where it's not, we don't wax as romantic that yeah. way, you know, because ultimately it's the, the goal is to connect with someone. And so it's, even though it's your story, it has to be, it has to be presented in such a way that it feels like it's your, the story of your, 
of, of the person on the other end of that, because otherwise you're just talking to yourself. And when you're talking to yourself, you're not really connecting with anyone. Well, and then the other the other aspect from the business end, and I get I get to dabble, let's say in both sides. I always have that that novel I'm going to write during NaNoWriMo, and then the nonfiction takes over. But you know, because I play in the book and the freelance writing world, um, in food and business, so I like to play in all the. I was I did have a point. Yes, <laughs> everybody comes at anything with their own background, educational, personal, whatever. But I also think that that's how they approach creative work as well. It's not just the business work. It's what makes you unique. And something I talk about all the time is what is the mission behind it? Uh, how is what you're creating going to help others? And it might be to entertain. That is just as, if not more valuable sometimes, people need that. Well, you're, what you're talking about is really your voice, right? I mean, you you still have to have your voice. So, you know, again, when I work with a founder or solopreneur or whoever, you know, and they're trying to tell their story, you know, I don't want it to feel like some corporate language. I, it needs to feel authentic because otherwise it can be anybody's story. But it's the, the trick. And I think, you know, I was thinking, Richard, when you were talking about the, the value of a good editor is that they know, like they hear your voice and they help you find it. And they also center you because, I you know, I also worked with an editor uh, for my book and it was amazing. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't want <laughs> to take get rid of all this stuff. But but from a, when you're telling a, a story from the brand perspective, what you really want to do is not only be authentic, but be so memorable that the person who needs you will go, where have you been all my life? Like I needed this and I didn't know you existed. So that's for me, that's kind of the, that's the mm -hmm. moment where it feels like, okay, the story mm -hmm. has, has landed. Well, that. that makes sense to me. So much. <laughs> Uh, so what other tips, uh, Rob, Richard, for people to develop their own voice? I, I think one thing is just to try a lot of different, as many different kinds of genres and mediums as one is inclined to, because I think you'll sometimes find that one is a really good vessel for whatever your particular way of expressing yourself is, and you just fit that like a glove. Um, and you may surprise yourself, like just trying that out, like just as an exercise. Like I'll say that the, the, the career path that I ended up in uh, for late night was uh, probably the third or fourth of several other things I was trying. And it was, the, it was the place where an opportunity opened up for me. It became a great thing. And so I poured all my energy into that. But I think just really trying out like a lot of different kinds of writings with no expectation of instantly obtaining a gig or money or even like publication just to see how it feels just like right by the test drive those uh those genres i, I have to chime in i f i got my freelance writing break literally the week i finished my first screenplay and this is back when i was living oh. in chicago and and it's just such a great example of what you're talking about because i i think the creative stuff is fun but for me the, this kind of writing, the nonfiction, is my happy place, right? The creative is still a good place to go, but definitely um, that's, you know, in a way, this path, right? You, you go towards the thing that you gravitate towards because, and I say this probably every episode, when you love what you do, it shows. When you don't love what you do, it really shows. So why not love what you do? I think developing a voice is, is, it's not so much a question of developing as we were talking about earlier, kind of finding a voice. And the way you find a, a voice is to listen, uh, to listen to your, to your own voice. And again, to get out of your own way, not try to arrange it, but to hear it and kind of replicate it that way. And then economize the way writers do through rewriting, I remember, I am, as you've probably figured out, a hard liner on efficiency and economy. 
I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think everything in a screenplay, for example, there's just two kinds of information there, what you see and what you hear. A description of it. So more uh, writers have been ruined by creative writing teachers who said to them in, in elementary school and in high school, your writing is so visual, you should write for the screen. Screenwriting is the least visual of all writing. If you read a description of a waterfall and it talks about the way it, the, the rainbow prismatic colors glint off the, uh, the, the, the spray and so on, it, it just flashes amateur, amateur. A, a description of a, of a waterfall in a screenplay goes like this. Waterfall. I mean, that, that's it. <laughs> It's just sightings, and we see this, we hear that. And here's the trick. Everything we see and everything we hear has to serve a purpose. What purpose? Always the same purpose. Move the story right. forward. That's it. Now, people say, well, what about character? The character is story. What is a character except what she does and what what she says? You know, Hamlet is, is considered one of the richest characters in all of, of uh, dramatic literature. Uh, I'll bet you know the play. Do you remember the playwright's description of Hamlet? It's three words, Prince of Denmark. Denmark. There's nothing about melancholy. There's nothing about suicide. <laughs> it's everything that he does. And then he says that establishes who he is. And guess what? Us too, what we do, what we say, isn't that our character? Somebody, a, a, a friend of mine who's a very successful TV writer, he's a member of a team. Somebody said, oh, you're a member of a team. Like, he does the character and you do the story. You know, like, what's more important to you, your uh, story or character, I'm often asked. And my <laughs> answer to that is, what's more important to you, your heart or your lungs? I see your point. You kind of need both. Kind of. <laughs> you know, it's interesting if you think about it, many of the great classic narratives, the name of the play is the name of a character, the, the protagonist, Julius Caesar, Oedipus Rex, Hamlet, Richard III, on and on and on and on and on. The Godfather, Citizen Kane, Bonnie and Clyde, and, and so on. Um, you make good points. So... It, and this is probably answering my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So what does this, what makes the story stand out? Well, it's got, it's got to resonate on a really deep level and whether it's a, it's the story of your business or it's a, a play or, you know, a movie or what have you, the story stays with you. It resonates and it, it speaks to you, I, I think. Um, you know, from a business perspective, the story has to feel true and it also has to feel important to you. And so there's there's an exchange that happens between your telling it and me receiving it. And it's what happens in between that I think is kind of where the magic is. Nice. I like that. So, Rob, what do you think? Um, I think uh, this probably comes to maybe from more of the comedy perspective, although I obviously can dovetail, but um, I think surprise is, you know, not nonstop surprise, but I think something that really like causes you to catch your breath, whether it's dramatic, whether it's funny, whether it's just, you know, taking you down a certain path, what you think is a certain path and then pulling you back. Um, that can be very superficial just for entertainment value, jump scare, the classic jump scare of horror. Or it can be like really profound, like, you know, the whole thing you thought you were watching is actually something different. Um, but to me, that's like, you know, you might say in our modern era, keeping people awake or, or keeping people from just <laughs> drifting between their devices, you know, like they have this idea of watching multiple devices, like, no, you should be paying attention to this because then you'll be in for a good ride. Wait, so people, they do watch more than one thing at the same time. That's a thing, right? Not only do people do that, uh, you probably know people who do that, but 
it's part of somewhat some of the studio's model to some extent is is uh to have more sort of like very like linear straightforward programming that's why there's like an emphasis on repeated ip you know like reacquiring ip and rebooting things because you know then, then they can these companies that have things going on across multiple platforms uh can be selling you something on your phone when you're watching something you're not being too distracted by the thing you're watching I would. I just want to tag on to something Orly said that I thought was insightful and had to do with feelings. We're talking about what what makes a story stand out. Uh, movies are completely fake. There's nothing in all of all of history that's less natural than a movie. I mean, everybody knows that's not uh, Butch and Sundance. It's Bob and and Paul, and uh, that they're putting makeup on their face and that uh, months can pass before somebody says hello and the other guy says, how are you? You know, I mean, it's all chopped up. It's com completely phony. They make recite dialogue as if they invented it. Everybody knows that writers wrote it and they memorize it there and, and they're reciting it. But there's something that is completely, totally real. And that is the feelings that are, are uh, provoked uh, engendered, uh, uh, say it how you like. And that's really all that matters. If you can just make people feel something passionate and, 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 and intense, they will come to that movie. Imagine you walking down the street and there's a guy standing on the pavement shaking and wobbling and you're so generous and caring a person that you kind of support them and lead them to a bus stop where there's a bench and you settle them down and they say, hey, thanks a lot. I'm fine. It's just like I saw this movie. I just came out of this movie terribly upsetting and and frightening and, and, and troubling, very, very disturbing. You would say, well, that's that's a movie I certainly don't want to see. No, the heck you would. You would immediately get, get in line to see that movie. If you walk past the movie theater and the door is open and everybody came out and they were sobbing, <laughs> You'd want to see what that was all about. You need to make people feel something, and it doesn't mean that you need to make them feel good. Scare them half to death. Break, break their hearts, but make them feel something. You know, my, my, my bride and I, we have a deal. Um, it's the movie. It's not she, but the movie that's supposed to keep me awake. She's allowed to poke me if I'm wheezing and snoring and spraying phlegm all over the people in the theater. But otherwise, if I drift off, uh, that's the movie's problem. That's not my problem. I used to try to, you know, take a deep breath and wake up. But I realized if it's, I've gone into movies where I was really, really weary and it woke me up because it was a, real, a really good, good movie. That's what makes people... Uh, tell other people you got to see this movie and that's what makes people go to movies and buy books word of mouth stars don't do it promotions can't do it otherwise they can't do it it's the ability to to evoke what orly said feelings in in the receiver of your message is there a story and i i love your your anecdotes richard so but anybody can chime in on this is there a story that is sitting with you? Is there a story that, that, that you've a, recently seen or read? Is there something that's just sitting with you that you can't shake? Well, you know, my new my new novel is coming. It's the first novel from a new publisher called Heresy Press, and the, uh, their first book is a collection of short stories by uh, anthology authors, a bunch of uh, different writers. And there are some extraordinary uh, uh, stories in there. It's, it's called Nothing Sacred. That's the collection. I eagerly com commend it uh, uh, to people. But it's, it's hard for me when I think about Netflix and I think about the movies that I've been to that I'm really, really engaged. I will tell you this, that if I've read a thousand screenplays. If you read the opening, the very first part of the very first page of a screenplay or a novel, and you want, 
want to read the rest of that page. And when you get down to the bottom of that page, you actually want, want to turn the page to see what happens after that. It's unusual. It's rare. My, uh, while I, I was in New York last week and we went to the uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum and there's not a single painting there that doesn't deserve its place in the in the museum. It's just beautiful, beautiful paintings and sculpture. We were looking at the Mati, uh, it's Degas and and uh, Manet ex exhibit, but everything that's there is is incredible. And people get the impression that paintings and sculpture are all wonderful. It's movies and novels that that aren't that good. When in in fact, for every picture in the in the Met. There's 8,000 silly, amateur, useless paintings. God bless the painters, who, the amateurs who, who think it's important to be creative and painted them. But really, really high quality, standout stuff is, un, is unusual. It's, it's rare. And I don't think you can do it by planning to do it. You have to simply try to tell the best story that you can. Something that's really engaging, again, that... You see the opening and you want to know more. It's a tall order to do that and to keep that up for 100 minutes, uh, the length of a, of a movie, or I don't know, the six or eight or 10 or 15 hours it takes to read a, a, a book. Wow. That, that's also a very vivid example. I appreciate that. What about you, Orly? Do you have something that's stuck in your head? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, when you were talking, I was thinking of <clears throat> one of the interviews <clears throat> that I did uh, in, from my, in my book, and I, I want to read it because it's just it's such a beautiful passage. Every time I read it, I just, uh, and it also reminds me that if you want to get a good story, you also need to know what questions to ask to get it started. Um, and, and that's, at least in my, in, in my line of work, that's kind of that's kind of what I found. Um, you know, I would say if you ask the wrong question, the answer doesn't matter. Um, so, um, so this is all about identity, and um, and so this is uh, the founder talking about the fact that um, that I realized. So this is what he said about and this is in terms of when it's time to change your identity because it doesn't fit. You've outgrown your logo or there's something about, you know, you just need, you need to kind of refine and get back to what you really, what you're really building. And here's what he said. I realized that we needed to change the heart of our brand. So we gave ourselves a heart transplant. Ooh. It's one of my favorite quotes in the book. Yeah. I give me a chills. I like that. <laughs> I like that one too. Yeah. It's actually Nick Bear who, um, who founded Saxby's, which is now, uh, I, I don't know if it's not, inter, it's not, I don't know if it's national yet. It's still mostly East Coast based, but uh, it's been moving into the Midwest. I don't think it's out in California yet. But um, anyway, there's, there's this idea that, which is why, you know, understanding who you are is so important to your story because you are the only one who really can articulate who you are. You know, my job is to help you get the language to the place where people really get it and they get it very quickly. Because in my universe, you have six seconds <laughs> to get somebody to say, tell me more. Um, and actually a little less than that, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, you've got about three seconds before I decided to move on. Um, and so I, I, I always, I know this is probably an urban myth, but you know, the average American adult now, um, the average American adult attention span is, uh, is eight seconds, and the average goldfish attention span is nine seconds, <laughs> which wow. is probably not true, but it sounds true, and it sounds- It, it sounds right. true. I, know. I, wanted to, I, I actually wanted to put that in the book, and my uh, editor said, don't put that in the book. Because <laughs> also it would change the moment you went to press. Well, exactly. Because you know, and oh, by the way, in in two thousand, our attention span was twelve seconds. Twelve seconds. So in twenty three years, it went down four seconds. That's that's, that's a not, lot. Like though. a third. I I I, I that's hate a to lot, do math. Actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay, before we get depressed about how unfocused people are in general, Rob, do you have a story to add to the stories about stories that made an impact for you? 
Um, I recently read this. Um, I think it's, I guess it's a novella. It's sort of a short book, uh, Nicholson Baker's The Mezzanine, which I recommend. I don't know if people have read it, but it's basically, it's interesting because there's no story to it really at all. It's just sort of a business, ex mid-level business executive taking this seemingly endless escalator up through his office complex through the middle of the day, he stops in the bathroom at one point, I think has lunch. But throughout the whole time, uh, he's just, his brain is just constantly observing and questioning everything in this environment, um, everything in sort of like our built in physical culture and then like the assumptions behind those. But it's like, it's kind of like all these thoughts that we have all had, but like if they're all put into one place and it's like incredibly like witty, firehouse where the details are just i mean uh, people of a certain age i think people around our age will probably recognize the very specific cultural moments of these things but like just the level of detail are so tactile that you come out of it like um thinking about why everything you know everything around you which i think can be something can be both fertile soil for you know the stories like richard and i do and i think the sort of problems that orly seeks to do as well as like that questioning beginner's mind of like questioning everything around you, taking nothing for granted, I think is really productive. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's, it's very funny in that sort of like Seinfeld observational comedy uh, way as well. So it doesn't feel like homework. Who's the, who's the author, Rob? Nicholson, Nicholson Baker. Nicholson Baker. It's pretty short. Now, if, if you send me that link mm -hmm. and Richard, if you send me that link and Orly, the link to your book will be in the recap anyway. So send me links so I can put that in. If you go to the devmethod.com slash blog, you can read the recap to this and the previous episodes of Gold Chat Live, aka the Dev Show podcast. Uh, what really great conversation. I am loving this. Before we wrap, um, I would love for each of you to gift a goal to our audience. So what is something that they could do today, tomorrow, like immediately to really um, up their storytelling skills or start develop them or really, it, it's basically a storytelling related goal. Uh, Rob, you want to start? Yeah. Um, pick something that you're doing that has a storytelling component to it and start with the ending. <laughs> That's, that's how I always do it. Like think about either, even if you don't know the ending, like what's the feeling? What's that vibe that I want? Like start there and then build it from that way backwards. And not just the ending ending, but the feeling of the ending. Yeah. That's awesome. And Orly? Um, yeah, so, and I love that, Rob. That's that's really good. Um, so for me, it's, mm -hmm. it's really um, thinking of your, that whole hero and um and and villain if i think if you can really identify the villain of your client's story because this is or, never, or your story right even, well not really <laughs> because ultimately it's really not about you I, I mean it is about you because it's your story but the story has to be relevant for the people you're trying to track so it, it's a little bit you know it's a little bit of a mind men, uh, meld there oh. because you know what I mean? It's like you you have to think in terms of, you know, someone's reading the story, right? And they have to relate to it. They've got it. They've it's got to connect with them. So, I think in terms of if you can think about, you know, what is it that your ideal client is really struggling with, and how are you solving that problem? I think it that's those are two things that can help you move your story in the right direction, so that somebody can kind of go, oh, they get me, right? You get my, you get what I'm struggling with, and so this because it's that whole like and trust piece that has to happen. Okay, now I I got it, and <laughs> the, and and so to, really to modify for any um, fiction writers who want to take on this goal, if you haven't identified the villain right. of your client in this case being your baby, whether it's a screenplay or novel, identify that what they're struggling with. Because that is also kind of the starting point. Because then the ending is how it gets resolved, whether it is the actual action or the feeling. See, like how I, I you would think I would sew. I do not. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Richard, what goal do you want to gift to our audience? 
Well, I think, I think uh, again, I'm going back to Orly. I'm just plagiarizing what Orly says, and I'm thinking about the word identity. Um, branding is all about identity, and I think all storytelling is about identity. Who am I? How do I know for sure? Uh, you know, Charles Manson's lawyer was a man named Irving Kanarek, and he was a notorious obstructionist. He believed if you had a hopeless client, the only thing way to serve him was to delay, and he would object to anything. And a uh, uh, Vince Bugliosi, whom I knew, um, was the prosecutor. He wrote a wonderful book, Helter Skelter, about the case. And there's a moment in the trial when uh, the uh, where Vince Bugliosi, the prosecutor, is swearing in a witness for the prosecution and says, "Would you would you state your name for the record?" Objection. Merrick <laughs> objects, and the judge says, "You object." to the witness stating his name for the record. He says, absolutely right, Your Honor. He says, well, uh, do you care to share? You know, in California, we just share everything. Do you care to, to share with the court any foundation f supporting that objection? He said, certainly, Your Honor. Hearsay. <laughs> How does he know who he is? Except that he was called that by his parents and everybody around him. Now, we all laugh at that, and it is kind of funny, but it is an interesting question. Didn't you ever have a dream that you woke up from that you thought was real and you were probably glad to wake? How do you know this? How do you know this ain't a dream? And I think that's what we're doing again. We're looking at the mirror reflecting back to us to make sure that this is, this is really, really what's going on. And we can never, never really be sure. Okay, so the goal then is to take some time and figure out who you are or who your characters are. That did I paraphrase you well, or do you want to re paraphrase me? Is I'm, I'm sorry, was that a was that a question? To, I did, uh, oh, yeah, I should have said that. Question mark. Hearing, hearing that. I, okay, so. The goal is because all stories about identity think about either who you are, how you know for sure, or rather your character. Who's your character and how do you know said character? Is that correct? Earlier, I, I said that every work of, of art, every narrative is a self-portrait. It's a, it's a journey of self-exploration. It's so, so I can hear my friends back in New York say, hey, Richie, self-exploration journeys. You've been baking your brains out there too long in the in the sunshine, but but that's truly what it is. It's about finding out more and more about yourself. And when audiences see you and really meet you, they realize not the separation from you. Here's my uh, Sopranos hat. I'm one of those people who believes that the Sopranos is the greatest achievement in the history of civilization. Tony Soprano is as different a person from me as that can be. I'm a intellectual elitist, a college professor, a, a Jew from Queens, and Tony is a, a, a Catholic mob boss. But when I look at him, I see a guy who has disagreements with his wife, issues with his adolescent children. I don't feel disconnected and apart from him, but quite the contrary, I, I resonate in him with his own humanity. And I realize not what separates us, but what we share. I think that's what it's really all about. Got it. I love that. So really, the core of everybody is the same. So you want to keep tapping into that. Yes. Question it, mark. It, 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 again, it's, it's uh, about uh, it requires staying open to surprises. Uh, Dr. Rao, we yell Dr. Rao compared dry, uh, writing to driving at night. You can only see as far as the uh, headlights illuminate, but that's far enough to you can drive across the whole country that, that way. And that's the way you kind of got to write your book. My new book, Deadpan, may surprise some people, but not, not any more than it, it surprised me. <laughs> I love that. 
Um, that's awesome. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Friends, please tell everybody where they can find you and learn more about you, your writing, etc. So Rob, where's the best place for people to learn more about you? My uh, books and TV projects can be found at robcutner.com and I'm on X at Apocalypse How and uh, Threads and Instagram at Rob Kuttner. Awesome. And Richard, where's the best place to find you? I've got a My whole website link is richardwalter.com. Um, if you, uh, uh, there's contacts there. My uh, media maven, Kathy Cabrera, is uh, uh, on 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 the watch for any anybody trying to, to to get a hold hold of me. That's the way. That's the best way to do it. Okay, fantastic. And Orly, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Uh, probably LinkedIn, but you can also go to zwebrands.com, um, and uh, you can see there, you know, around my process and uh, my press page has you know articles and places where I've spoken and, you know, various, various things there, but uh, LinkedIn, I, I, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So it's a good place to, to see what I'm up to. Excellent. And as I mentioned before, I'm at the Deb Method everywhere and I go live every Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific and you can subscribe on YouTube or we also go live on LinkedIn or, and Facebook. And you can also look up The Deb Show on your favorite place where you get your podcasts or go to thedebmethod.com slash blog for all the recaps and the replays of these wonderful conversations. And like I said, I will have all of your links. I typically also put in the LinkedIn links because this is how we remain part of each other's community by making that connection. Just drop a note and say, this is where we met. We would love to connect with you all. Again, fabulous conversation. Uh, what final thought do you want to leave people with, uh, Orly? Um, can you can you give me a little bit more direction than like just the thought? I mean, in terms of of no, no, no. You don't. Get, uh, I I no. leave these questions open ended. Something throw purpose. something out there. Um, well, what, I would, what what final thought on story and storytelling would you like to share with you. the audience? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say that what I would leave somebody with is um, ask a lot of questions, listen more than you speak, and um, and when you don't know, ask ask your clients. You know, we talked about this whole idea of who am I from a client from from a brand perspective. Um, I, I really I love surveys because you can you can ask a few questions and get a lot of feedback that way. But go talk to your clients and find out why why they work with you. I think that's like one of the key questions that um, I have found leads to a lot of interesting uh, answers. Love that. Thank you. I knew you would have a good answer. Um, Rob, final thought. Um, I think. I think kind of like I was saying earlier, like a story is a bridge between your mind and your heart and other people's. Like it's the shortest bridge there is. So, and that's why it's so hard to create good ones or to find new ones that haven't been graphic. But um, people would rather hear a story, rather feel a story than hear a fact, I think. Uh, Ooh, that's true. Oh, that's so true on so many levels, right? I just, I just mic drop at that. <laughs> People would rather hear a story than learn a fact. Love that. Thank you. Okay, final, final thought to you, Richard. Well, the, the, the imagine you're walking down the street and somebody runs up to you all wild in their eyes and they say, hey, hey, I, I had this dream that I have to tell you. I, I just have to tell somebody this dream. Can I tell you? And let's say you're so generous and gracious that you agree to let them do it. Uh, and then they say to you, okay, thanks a lot. Before I get started though, I want you to know this is gonna take two hours and I need $15 right, right now. You figure crank up the lithium on this guy's trip. <laughs> but that's what every writer is asking everybody to do. What I'm trying to say is it's crazy 
my dad was a musician and he was a very successful bass player, primarily the acoustic, uh, the, the classical repertoire, made a very good living. But what was he doing? He was dragging horse hair. That's what the bow is, is made out of. Of course, sheep cut. Uh, and if somebody said, why are you doing that? And he said, well, because it's going to make a sound that's so beautiful, people will line up in the snow and the heat to pay money to come into a chamber and hear people do that. Again, you'd figure this is crazy. What I'm trying to say is what we do is crazy and stop <laughs> being so sensible about it and stop being rational about it. And instead of, uh, you know, revel in, 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 the, in the madness, the madness of it all. Embrace the madness. I love that. But it's true. And if you are a storyteller and you love telling stories, then love the stories, right? Immerse yourself. I, I love revel in the madness. <laughs> Thank you all so much for that. Um, and for this wonderful conversation on storytelling, thank you, Rob Kuttner, Richard Walter, or Luziwi. And thank you for tuning in, for choosing your storytelling goals. We hope we've given you lots of food for thought. So go out there, write some more stories, go for it, because we know you can do it. Thanks, everyone.